faith and we're just going to keep believing the Lord and uh, doing what we need to do. So, you know, that's what happens. I kind of, you know, when, when you first get there and you first get that news, you know what I mean? I, I have no doubt at some point, you know, between the time that the king made the announcement and, and the three Hebrew children, you know, of course, all we read about in the Bible is when they were facing, you know, the king, and they said, we're not careful to answer you. Yeah. We don't have to think about this. Here's what we're going to do. Yeah. And, uh, you know, somewhere between then and when they were being prepared to, I mean, I, I have no doubt all along if I, if I know anything about human beings, myself being one, you know, they were standing there thinking, um, okay, Lord, we, we know you're going to deliver us. We know you're going <laughs> to, um, any time now would be good. But yeah, I mean, that's just human nature. I'm sure they were standing there when they opened the doors of that furnace. And correct me if I'm wrong. Did it not say that it was seven times hotter than it usually was? And I have no doubt, no matter how far back they were, when they opened those doors and they were preparing to throw them in, you know, they're, um, excuse me, Lord, uh, we talk about this. It, um, are, are you paying attention here? You know, you're not on a coffee break somewhere. You know, I don't know if they had those feelings. I have no doubt as a human being, I would have been asking, uh, any time now, God, you know. And you see what I'm saying? And I, I've been through those times. I've been through those things, and it's like, yeah, I, I you know, any time now, God. God just, God just keeps coming on the scene, and He just keeps reminding me through people. You can't imagine the number of people that will text me out of the clear blue. I had an incident with a young man we've been ministered to. His wife, you know, George and Evelyn there, and his wife's going through, and they're really in a hard spot, and they're doing their best to trust God, and they're just waiting. And somebody had shared with me a song the other day. And, and the title of the song was Plans. And it was all about how God, I need to send that to you, Sister Robin, remind me to do that. It's all about how God has our lives planned out and, and he's always, you know, got something going for us. So Juan and I listened to that song and my gosh, it just blessed me so much. So, you know, I felt like I got to share this with George. So I forwarded that song to him so he could listen to this, this testimony and this song about God's plans for our lives. And uh, he texted me back and he said, oh my gosh, he said that song was such a blessing. He said, he said today in my devotion time, and, and then he shared his devotion with me. Guess what his devotion was about? How about that? You think God's not paying attention? You, you think God's not paying attention that he's on a coffee break? And those are the things that take me from <coughs> my seasons of doubt. Or more seasons of anxiety or impatience. Because I do sometimes get a little impatient. And I, I believe and I, I trust everything that God has said to me. But when we get right to the edge, and we gotta we look kind of up, you know, God, I thought you were gonna, you know, I thought you were gonna deliver me from this. And then I get this word from God, he says. I never told you I was going to deliver you from it. He said, if you just pay attention and trust me, he says, I'm going to deliver you in it. Kind of like he was talking to Mary and Martha, because they were convinced God didn't show up in time. He said, if you had only been here, Lazarus would not be dead. And that, I, when I got that one time, that, you know, when they said that, because the, the apostles were the same way, they were in that same place, and they said, you know, Jesus, don't you think we should have left? I mean, Lazarus is your friend, you know, and you promised some things here. Don't you think we need to be, he said, no big hurry. He says, Lazarus is asleep. Well, yeah, no, but yeah, but Lord, you need to find that he, you know, come on. He, he said, no, you don't understand. Lazarus is dead. <clears throat> and then he said something that just floors you. Jesus, about his very best friend, he says, no, you don't understand. Lazarus is dead, and I'm glad. He quantified that statement. He says, I'm glad 
for your sake. He said, because I'm going to do something miraculous. I'm going to do something so miraculous that people are going to look at it and say, only God. That's what God keeps showing up and telling me, Sister Rosemary, when I get in those places, when I get in those times, and I begin to, I begin to, I don't begin to doubt, but I gotta say, I begin to wonder just a little bit. Is it okay if I'm just, can I just be transparent with you? And I hope you don't get tired hearing this. But it's the only way I know how to share. It's the only way I know how to share because I, I know I'm not that much different than anybody else. There isn't any way that you could convince me that some of you in this place this morning haven't been in that place or maybe are in that place right now where you're just beginning to wonder, okay, God, uh, what now? What now? And God shows up and he says, I didn't tell you I would deliver you from it, but I will deliver you in it and I will deliver you, Darlene said it a few minutes ago, I will deliver you through it. I understand why then when I come out here on Sunday and I begin to get into the presence of the Lord and I've heard that word autumn from God, I get just a little bit excited. Because what God is telling me, he said, if you're just willing to trust me, if you're just willing to walk by faith, he said, I'm going to do some miraculous things through you. Uh, you know, when most preachers, oh God help me, most preachers, when they hear a word from the Lord that says, I'm going to do some miraculous things, you know, you, you immediately begin to think of, can I name some names? Is that okay? You know, you begin to think of, you know, T.D. Jakes and Jensen Franklin and, and, and Stephen Furtick and, and, you know, some of these guys that are on TV and, you know, and they're, man, they're, they're not touching hundreds and, you know, they're, they're touching thousands. I mean, they're just... Wow, God is really blessing their ministry. And, and I'd say some of what they do is miraculous. And when God says, I'm going to do some miraculous things through you, us preachers all kind of immediately, I don't know, we just start seeing stars or something. I don't know what it's all about. But I don't know how many people alive today would ever say, you know, man, I wish I was Lazarus. <laughs> Matter of fact, there's probably even people out there that say, man, I wish I was Job. Now you talk about some men that God did some miraculous things through. You know, lots of people want to be Elijah. Lots of people want to be Paul. You know, but all they see is the... I got to tell you, you talk about somebody who went through. How, how many times was Paul beat? And put in prison. And matter of fact, most of the writings that you see in the New Testament, he wrote while he was in jail, in stocks, in chains, is when he wrote most of that. God was doing some miraculous things. So, you know, we look around and we have this definition of what we perceive as miraculous. But let me tell you, God's perception of that is altogether different. Yeah. But I can't help get excited when I hear the voice of the Lord speak to me and he says, I'm going to do some miraculous things through you. Well, okay, God. Anytime you're ready, <laughs> let's get on with it. And God says, just be patient. Just be patient. And that's hard, <coughs> isn't it, Robin? Robin? Robin's getting this already, aren't you? You're getting it. But that's the way it is. God's got to work out. God's got a plan, and he's going to work that plan if we're just willing. And here's where it brings me to where I want to be today, you know, heart postures. And, and Brother Rick didn't even know this, but he said something pro so profound to me the other night, and it really has impacted me because I've already told you before. I had told you that I was planning this sermon and, and um, you know, the, the five heart postures of prayer. And of course, we're getting ready to, to go into a a lesson here about intercessory prayer, and uh, you're going to hear a little bit about that here today because you're going to get some definitions about some things, um, you know. But it just kind of all flows together, and it's just so beautiful the way the Lord works it out. But Brother Rick had shared something with me the other day that, that was just so profound that it fit right in here, and I just love what he was saying because you know, in, in order for this revival 
that we're talking about to be successful, some things have to be in place prior to. Right. And, and one of the things that we have to learn to do and learn to do well in order to have that revival break out and, and be what it's supposed to be, we need to learn and, and to make sure that we know how to pray. Because that's where revival comes from. Revival comes and, 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 and blooms and blossoms you know, from, a, from a church and from people who learn how to pray. That's the beginning. And you look at any outpouring, you look at any great revival through the years, <clears throat> any great thing that's happened through the years, you know, in, in, any, in any country or any place around the world, you'll see that somewhere along the line, if you get into the history of it, if you get into the birth of it, you know what you'll find? You'll find a group of people that got together and said, we need to begin to pray. You know, Brother Rick was sharing with me the other night. <coughs> Excuse me. He said, I got to tell you something. He said, I know it's going to sound a little strange. But he said, I went to pray for you. He said, I, I felt like I wanted to pray for you. And he said, I got ready to pray. And you, you help me if I get it wrong. He says, I got ready to pray. And the Spirit of the Lord spoke to me. He says, No. Don't do that. Thank you. <laughs> 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 then he went on, and the Holy Spirit began to speak to him. And the Holy Spirit began to say to him, said, you need to understand something. Prayer is not a time that we come together and start telling God a bunch of things he already knows. Yeah. 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 Now, I'm not saying... You know, that we shouldn't, you know, make requests and that we shouldn't do that. God tells us to do that. Right. You know, I believe it's Philippians, right? Somebody help me out with that. I believe it's Philippians. It says, be anxious for nothing. Be anxious for yeah. nothing. You know, but in everything, through prayer and supplication, he says, make your requests known yeah. Yeah, yeah. to God. Yeah. And the peace of God. I love that. Oh, yeah. I love to finish it. So don't just make your requests known. He says, if you do it. If you make your request known, he said, the peace of God that passes all understanding will keep your heart and mind in Christ Jesus. Wow, what a promise. So I'm not saying, <clears throat> I'm not saying that we don't make requests known. That's not what I'm saying. But sometimes when we get together to pray, that's all we do. Well, we're going to pray. Okay, well, what's our list? <coughs> all right, we got our list. Let's pray. And we pray and we, we check all the boxes and, you know, and, and let's face it. What are we doing? We're literally just telling God stuff he already knows. That's why we've kind of changed up how we're praying over our basket. God knows the names in that basket. God sees the names on this floor. He already knows. Does that mean we're not going to continue to cover it? We're not going to continue to, to bring it before the Lord? No. But we're not going to spend all of our time doing that. The Spirit of the Lord spoke to Brother Rick. He said, you don't have to take all that time and, and use prayer just as a time to tell God things he already knows. He said, prayer is a time when we communicate with God and prayer should be a time used to draw us closer in our relationship to God. And trust me, when people begin to do that, that's why great revivals have started with a group of people who know how to pray. And when I say they know how to pray, I'm not talking about coming together and checking off the boxes and calling requests. They, they, know, they know the reason for prayer. It's to bring us into a closer, more close-knit relationship, not only where we talk to God. <laughs> ah, there you go. Prayer is supposed to be a conversation. And in a conversation, two things are supposed to happen. It's one of the things that I had to learn a little bit. You know, I've always been a great talker. I haven't always been a great listener, you know. And some of us are like that. You know, in a conversation, it's all one-sided. We do that all the time with God. We think, well, when, when I'm done talking, amen. Not much of a conversation, is it? You understand what I'm saying? 
But here, you know, God's telling us and trying to teach us and say, look, there's, there's more to it. I'm not here to criticize you and tell you for, the, for your entire life you've been praying wrong. <clears throat> I'm not going to tell you that. What I am going to tell you and encourage you is, you know, there's better ways. There's more productive ways. And when I say more productive ways, what I'm talking about is more productive for you in your spiritual life. I'll give you some of the best advice I've ever given you in the 14 years I've been here as pastor. Want me to give you the best advice I've ever given to you? Take time once in a while. Listen to God. Just can I say it the way Bobby would say it? Shut up and listen. Just shut up for once and listen. God has some things he wants to say to you. God has some things he wants to tell you. Let me, let me give you some of these. I'm going to read these scriptures for you. This is where I'm going to talk about and I'm going to, I'm going to get through this. I want to really want to share this with you. Matthew 6, 19 through 21. Matthew 6, 19 through 21. Proverbs 4 and 23, and then specifically I want to focus on Psalm 51. Psalms 51. Let me go down over here. Uh, and I believe this, maybe Gary or somebody uh, that was raised in the Catholic Church from Catechism can tell me this, but I'm told the four basic forms of prayer are a prayer of blessing and adoration, right? You could probably name these without the list, couldn't you, Gary? A prayer of blessing and adoration, a prayer of petition, a prayer of intercession and a prayer of thanksgiving. And this is an answer to your question because the other day Bonnie asked me that. Because when we talk about intercessory prayer and interceding, Bonnie says to me, I've heard that all my life. What does that mean? Prayer of blessing and adoration means praising God. Prayer of petition means asking for what we need, including forgiveness. And she shared that story with you about my grandpa. My grandpa Bowser was, I mean, that's all I ever know, knew of him as, a, as, you know, he was a pastor. Right. I don't remember him doing really anything else. You know, he did some things in addition to pastoring, but as long as I have memories of my grandpa Bowser, which is my mom's dad, he was a pastor. A wonderful, wonderful man of integrity, wonderful man of God. And, and he was all about, you know, family prayer time. You never, you never went to Grandma and Grandpa Bowser's house. Before you left, you stopped and you took time to pray. Bonnie and I tried to model that. But I can promise you, you always heard this. In every prayer, my granddad, I ever heard him pray. In every prayer I ever heard him pray, you would always hear my grandfather re repeat these words. You know, as he's praying, he would get to the point and he would say, Now, Lord, if I've done anything today to displease you, if I've done anything today, God, that, that I've said something to offend someone, or I've done something, God, that might have displeased you, God, I ask for your forgiveness. I repent, Lord, and just ask for you to forgive me. And this, this, was, this was a man of God, you know, that was just after God's heart, and, and, but he always prayed that prayer, you know, that prayer of petition. Not just asking for the things that he needed, but asking for God for forgiveness. So that's the prayer of petition. A prayer of intercession. Intercessory prayer is asking for what others need. That's what it is to be an intercessor. It ain't about me anymore. You know, I'm interceding now for others. That's what a prayer of intercession is supposed to be about. And that's one of the prayers we're supposed to be praying. Every prayer we pray ain't supposed to be about us. Imagine that. <coughs> and lastly, a prayer of thanksgiving. A prayer that thanks God for what he has done and what he has given us. Four parts of prayer are adoration. Acts. Can you remember Acts? A-C-T-S. Some of you know this stuff, don't you? Go ahead. Say it out loud. Adoration. Confession. Thanksgiving, you got it. I see, and I didn't even plan on giving the test. <laughs> but that's the, that's the basic parts of prayer: adoration, confession, thanksgiving, and, and supplication. That's the acts. And then it talks about the five heart positions of prayer. <clears throat> and I love this because now now's when it gets a little. Some of this stuff that we're looking at, I say, well, yeah, Pastor, that just kind of come on. That's that's no brainer stuff. We all do that, well, do we? We don't, we should. Here's when it gets a little bit 
Because the five heart positions of prayer are worship. We got that down. I know how to worship. I can worship with the best of them. That was a joke. <laughs> but then it goes worship <coughs> and wait. That was a little harder for some of us. Come on. Worship and wait. Because you got to understand something. We are finite beings. So everything we think about, Mike, everything we do, everything is on a timetable, right? Because from birth to death, you know, um, I've heard somebody, they read this sometimes at funerals. You know, they read the little poem about the dash. Because on the headstone, it gives the day of the birth and the day of the death. And then between them, what represents a whole entire life lived is this little dash. But you understand? You have a beginning and you have an end, and then you got this little tiny dash in the middle. But it represents, but that's how we think. That's how we were created. It's how we were designed. We, we were just finite beings. We have a beginning, and I'm talking about this earthly life now. We have a beginning and we have an end. So for us, you know, we're the kind of person was, you know, we can't waste a lot of time waiting here. We can't, you know, it needs to be done, and it needs to be done yesterday. Because that's the way we think. But you understand? God doesn't think like that. That's why God says, my thoughts are up here, and yours are down here. You understand? God is not a finite being. God has no beginning and no end. That's what the Bible said. So God doesn't think like we think. And when, when we begin to think about things that need to be done and things we want God to do, I don't know about you, but I want them done. And I want them done now. God is constantly telling me, calm down. Be patient. We'll get there. I don't know about you, but that's one of the hardest things in the world for me to do. And even harder for my wife. God bless her soul. She is definitely her father's daughter. Which is why I spent the entire afternoon the other day having to put this retractable ladder thing up on the side of our thing. Because she made up her mind she wanted it done. And she wanted it done now. That day. So being the good husband that I am. If you want to see it, she'll show you a picture of it. It's there. It's hanging on the wall. No, I didn't. All I asked for at the end was a thank you. Which I did get, by the way. You know, it's easier for some of us to think about that kind of stuff. But do you understand? That's the way it works. We have these finite minds and we have these human brains and they think in terms of beginning and end and, and just, you know, so much time for stuff. But God doesn't think that way because God, God's mind doesn't work that way. His thoughts are up here, ours are down here. God has no beginning. God has no end. And, and if God needs to do it and it's going to happen, it's going to happen in his time. And it's going to happen exactly the way he wants it to do. And he's going to get the glory out of it that he deserves to get. That's why, that's why he waited and didn't go see Lazarus and pick him up out of his sick bed. Because he had a plan. And he had a design. And then he spoke to Mary. At, did I get it right? Which one did he have the conversation with Martha. at the graveside? Was it Martha? Martha. Okay, thank you. You know, I get those names wrong every now and then. You know, Paul will be correcting me for Noah and Moses. <laughs> he was talking to one of the sisters. And she said, God, if you'd only been here. Jesus, if you'd only been here. And he says, Martha, what are you so worked up about? What are you so worked up about? You, you, you know this. You know, anybody who believes in me, anybody who has a relationship with me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. She said, yeah, Jesus, I get it. I understand that. You know, he said, you know, yeah, he's, he's in the resurrection, the day, whatever, it's going to come. And, and Jesus said, no, Martha, you don't get it. Resurrection is not an event. Resurrection in life is not an event. It's a person. Yes. And I'm it. 
You understand? Can, can, we, can we begin to think about, oh, God, thank you. God's helping me now. He's connecting the dot. You understand when we begin to talk about revival and an outpouring in this local church, it's not an event. It's not an event. It's a person. How do we get in touch with the person who is revival? <coughs> Communication and conversation. Anybody know another word for that? <coughs> Why do you just love when God connects the dots? Oh, my goodness. So when we begin to look at Psalms 51. Oh, my, it's 25 after already. Let's look at Psalms 51. I want to go over these real quick. If you read down over Psalms 51, it gives us the five essential heart postures. Okay? In Psalm 51. Okay? Number one, write these down. Number one, five essential heart postures. Number one is a needy heart. We find that in Psalms 51. It says, have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love. Have mercy on me. Can I put it another way? God, I need you. God, I need you. Have mercy on me, God. That's a needy heart, a submissive heart. He says, wash me and I will be whiter than snow. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. Whatever you got to do, Lord, wash me. Wash me. Take it out of me, God. Cleanse me. Make me what you want me to be. We're going to submit to the Lord. An obedient heart. It says in Psalm 51, Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. That's an obedient heart. Whatever it takes, God. Whatever it takes. An expected heart. Then I will teach transgressors your way. But what he's saying, God, as you do these things, here's what I expect is going to happen. I, I have an expectant heart because you're going to raise me up. You're going to have mercy on me. You're going to cleanse me. You're going to create something special in me. And then what's going to happen? I'm going to go out and I'm going to start telling others. I'm going to start telling others. And then a restored heart. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit. A broken spirit and a contrite heart. Oh God, you do not despise. How do we get into that place where we're in the right place with God? you got to get your heart right. And I'm not talking about just when we come to an altar of prayer. And I'm going to close with this because Bonnie and I were having this conversation. I think we even talked about it a little bit uh, yesterday in men's group because Mike was sharing with us about, you know, the attributes, you know, of a man of God, what a man of God looks like. And one of the things he talked about was generosity. And, you know, that's the spirit of the heart. And I shared with him, and, and Bonnie already shared with you today, the outpouring of generosity that was seen yesterday. And it's true. It's there. Generosity still exists in the world. Generosity still to a great degree exists even in this country. All you got to do is give them a reason. And generosity pours out of people. But here's the deal. What God wants from us is not just to let that pour out of us when we're presented with a need. You understand? That's why when the Bible talks about giving and this is not a tithing and giving message, okay? Because I'm not talking about bringing offerings to the church. I'm not talking about, I'm talking about living with a generous heart. And, 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 and when we talk about giving, I'm not talking about just throwing money in an offering plate. That's not what I'm talking about. You know, what the Bible talks about, you know, when you give, he said, don't give out of necessity. In other words, don't wait till there's a need presented to you before your generosity comes out. What he's saying is make it a posture of your heart so that you live every day in a spirit of generosity. And you know what I said to Bonnie? I said, can you imagine what this world would look like? <clears throat> what this world would be like to live in if people lived in a spirit of generosity. Not just when you know, they were presented with a need. But if they just every day had this spirit of generosity that just oozed out of them and flowed out of them, and it was just a posture of their heart, yeah, it's in there. For a lot of people, OJ, it's in there. It's buried kind of deep, but it's in there. You present them with a need, you present them with a good reason, and somewhere along the line, generosity is going to float to the top, and it's going to pour out. 
Can you imagine what it would be like if people would just live with that? Every morning when they get up, you know, somewhere along the line, it just floats to the top. And the first, one of the first thoughts they have every morning when they get out of bed, wonder who I could bless today. Wonder who I could pray for today. God, what can I do for you? What can you do through me today? You know, and, and then we come into this time of prayer when we begin to seek God and have a communication with God. God just might, if you give him a chance, share a name. <coughs> Bring a face to your mind. And say, here you go. You need somebody to bless today? I believe God can do that for you. Every day. Every day when you get up, I pray that over you. I really do. I pray that over you. That every day when you get up, God brings a face or a name to you. Say, hey, Robin, here's a, here's a person for you today. Why don't you find a way somewhere today, somehow, bless this person. You may need to call them on the phone. You may need to stop over and visit. You may need to stick a card in the mail. You may need to take them shopping. You may need to, you know, take, take a basket to them. You may need, you may, please don't, please don't anybody take this the wrong way. But you, you may, may, may go to somebody's house that, you know, give them a bath. I know for some of you, you're thinking, God's blessed her to do that stuff. God's blessed her to do that stuff. You understand what I'm saying? So it's, it's, it's the postures of our heart. And I don't mean during church. I don't mean on Sundays. I don't mean during prayer service. When I talk about the postures of our heart, I'm talking about a posture of my heart that I live with every day. And, and I'm learning it. I'm learning it. And God's helping me. And understand, sometimes even... Oh, God help me. I keep coming back here and I apologize. I, I, I don't mean to do it, but I just can't help it because God's just trying to teach me and raise me up and use it. And I want to use it for God's glory. That's why when I walk through the doors of the cancer center, when I walk through there Tuesday, you know, knowing full well, because, you know, I got I to walk through there standing on a promise. You know what the promise is that God brings to me? He says, if you drink any deadly thing, it's not going to hurt you. Well, I can tell you right now, what they're going to do to me on Tuesday is stick a needle in my arm, and they're going to pump me full of poison. That's what they're going to do. But God says, don't worry about it. It ain't going to hurt you. Mm -hmm. What I get more concerned about, and I'm not meaning to brag, but I'm, I'm asking God to help me live this way. I'm asking God to put my heart in this posture so that when I walk through those doors on third, Tuesday morning, I'm not thinking about what's going to happen to me. I walk through that door and I begin immediately to kind of glance around the room and say, okay, God, why am I here? Who am I supposed to bless? Who do I need to speak a word of encouragement to today, God? There's some reason you got me here. There's some reason you're putting me in this chair. So please, God, Show me what I need to do. And all I'm saying to you is, please, get in communication with God. Learn how to pray in a way that it brings us into a heart posture where we live every day with that on our hearts. And say, God, who do I need to bless today? Why do you have me on this earth? Will you stand all over this building? God has a reason for you to be here. And I know sometimes it's hard when we're sitting at home and we're sick. I know OJ spent quite a few hours this week home in your sick chair. But guess what? Somewhere along the line, God can bring hearts to you. God can bring names to you. God brings names to you. And guess what? You can still be productive in the kingdom work of God sitting in that chair. Because although you're bound to the chair in your body, God's spirit is not bound. And you can release it. How do I know that? Because God says the power is yours. Whatsoever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatsoever you release on earth will be released in heaven. So sitting in that chair in your apartment, you have the power to release healing. You have the power to release things to people on this earth sitting in that chair. And that's where we need to be. We need to be living our life with a heart posture that says, God, I want to be used of you. I want to be used of you. And that is my sermon for you today.
to begin to find a way to position, posture your heart before God and say, use me.